So as Nino said, this is Next Generation Batteries, A Leap Forward, and um, you are looking at the rainbow of the battery industry in Canada here. Everybody is representing a different slice of the pie. Mixed metaphors, sorry. Um, and to kick us off, uh, Mark, I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, you probably out of most people on this panel see the greatest variety of battery technologies come through your door at Novanex. Um, also, I'm realizing, I'm very sorry, everyone. We're going to backpedal for a sec. You are supposed to introduce yourselves. <laughs> I do apologize. Um, so, Mark, I've kind of introed you. Keep going, and then we'll go down the, the panel. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark MacArthur, the director of R&D at Novonix Battery Testing or Technology Solutions in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, we are a um, company that does a lot of work with a lot of different people in a couple different countries. So we focus largely on the materials and technology side of lithium ion batteries. Um, we have a group located in the USA that's working on uh, producing and increasing the capacity of their synthetic graphite to 150,000 tons per year. And we have a division in Canada in which I'm based uh, where our cathode materials team and our cell testing team are located. So what we have in our Canadian division is the ability to uh, improve the... Um, improve essentially the R&D cycle of uh, our customers. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, we have the capability of making um, battery cells with a various different format with a pilot manufacturing line, as well as we have over 2,000 uh, testers to actually cycle these cells. So we do a lot of things with a lot of people. Hello, everybody. Uh, good to be here. Nino and Emma, thank you for the opportunity, and I appreciate uh uh, being here, I'm sorry for this. I'm not trying to be cool. Um, so I, I had business development for Blue Solutions in North America. Uh, some of you may know Blue Solutions is a Quebec-based company that um, is uh, the sole manufacturer of solid-state batteries. Uh, we've been deploying this uh, for a couple of decades. Uh, in 2011, uh, we started with cars, then uh, with buses. Uh, people in general they see lithium ion as the prevailing technology. They see solid state as the future. Uh, but nevertheless, we've been doing this for a long time, as I mentioned. So uh, a lot of things going on. We're, right now, we're working on the fourth generation of our product that is going to be more uh, focused on um, the passenger cars. A very exciting uh, developments that we have. Uh, we're working with OEMs to try to align our strategy with them. And uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Rafael Janik. I'm the COO at Xanadu Quantum Technologies. Uh, we might be a couple generations past what most of the panel will be talking here about. Uh, we're focused on building, actually, the next generation of computers, uh, which can do many, many things phenomenally well. But one thing that they do exceptionally well is simulate uh, matter at the quantum level. Um, and because of this, uh, our application team is actually very much focused on looking at how to simulate the core properties of current generation, next generation batteries, but really be able to move uh, all the work that we do today um, in silico. We have a few partnerships with major OEMs focused on this, um, but the core thing is like the transformational impact of quantum computing was still five to 10 years away uh, before it'll really start making an impact in the way that we tackle material problems today. All right, thank you. My name is Asma Mokrini. Uh, thanks, Nino, for the invitation, and I'm so happy to be part of, of this panel. So um, I come from the National Research Council. It's uh, one of the largest organizations uh, in Canada uh, doing R&D. Uh, so we work with many industry, many hospitals, many government departments. Um, uh, I come from uh, Boucherville, with, where we have actually a research center on automotive and surface transportation, uh, and basically, Actually, we focus on, on different uh, fields, actually, of R&D related to transportation. And my team is really focused on clean energy uh, development. We work, uh, we have a program, actually, which, which uh, oversees all those electrification activities called SEED program, Clean uh, and Efficient Energy Transportation System. So uh, there are many other teams, actually, working on uh, EV-related 
uh, themes. Uh, in, in the case of my team, actually, we work really on, on materials and, and processes. So we have actually two kinds of, of projects. We have projects that directly support uh, the SMEs, the Canadian SMEs. That means, you know, current technology uh, in terms of mineral processing to battery grade materials, uh, <coughs> looking at the manufacturing of lithium and battery, so addressing challenges with the current technologies. And we do have other kind of R&D projects which are, are more innovation, dr driving Canada's innovation agenda. And those projects are really defined with initiatives like the Canadian Battery Initiative or the Critical Mineral Initiatives, and where we look at the next generation of whether next generation materials or components for the current technology or completely new technologies such as solid state batteries. And we also work a lot on, on trying to uh, you know, develop the know-how on how to recycle those materials, uh, how to green the manufacturing processes. So there are so much to do. Uh, and we are trying actually to be really relevant and to do activities that have impact on the uh, different partners, industrial partners we are working with. So. Great. Um, thank you um, to uh, Electric Autonomy and for uh, Dan Jen for inviting uh, Nano One here, and it's um, it's an honor to speak here to the audience. Uh, my name is Dan Blondell. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Nano One Materials. Uh, we are based in uh, Vancouver, uh, and we also have manufacturing facilities in Quebec, just outside of Montreal. Um, Nano One Materials is a technology company developing process uh, technology to improve the way lithium ion battery cathode materials are made. So that's where you combine lithium, nickel, manganese, and cobalt, or lithium, iron, and phosphorus into active materials that will store energy in the battery, of course. And um, our, our goal is to, uh, to drive down cost, um, environmental footprint, and the energy intensity, CO2 footprint of, uh, of, of the cathode materials. But that's not just in the, uh, in, in the process of making them, that's also in the supply chain. Our technology, which we call our one-pot process, allows us to use alternative sources of lithium, nickel, manganese, and cobalt um, to actually um, uh, leapfrog um, uh, intermediate chemicals like lithium hydroxide or nickel sulfate or cobalt sulfate to, to uh, eliminate not only steps in the process, but also to, uh, to eliminate a, a very a serious and very large waste stream that is tolerated in places like China, but we don't believe it will, uh, it's uh, scalable in any way, shape, or form in North America or Europe or, or, or actually probably most of the, uh, the um, Indo-Pacific region as well. So that's kind of the basis of our technology. Um, we, we do work up and down the supply chain because it's not only a cathode play, it's a supply chain play. Uh, we uh, we're, we uh, have a, um, a partnership and a large investment from Rio Tinto in Nano One. Um, and we work with automotive companies, and uh, and we also have partnerships in the midstream with BASF and Umicore. So uh, we have a lot of touch points in the industry. We see a lot of how the supply chain comes together. Um, and I think uh, we have a generational opportunity here in Canada to create a, a long-term, sustainable, sticky supply chain that is very differentiated from the way it's done in Asia um, uh, today. And um, we're going to be talking about that extensively. Thank you. So great. So great to be here. <clears throat> Sarush here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm CEO of Nano Explorer and Volta Explorer. Uh, Nano Explorer is a business involved in manufacturing of graphene. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with what graphene is. Graphene is like a carbon fiber on a steroid. It's, it's a graph. If you look at graphite as a deck of cards, graphene is a single card. It got the Nobel Prize in 2010, and we are the largest producer of graphene in the world. We have about 40% of the market share. So. Uh, we, we produce this material, this graphene material, and incorporate it into different applications and different markets, from all the way from recycled plastics to, to transportation. We have about 70% of our businesses in transportation, uh, making uh, graphene-enhanced composites parts for uh, class seven, class eight trucks and buses. So um, with, with our partnership with, uh, with Martin Rea, which is the largest shareholder of Nano Explorer, we started uh, a joint venture called Volta Explorer, which is focused on uh, producing a lithium ion battery cell. Right now we have a one megawatt hour battery facility up and running in, in Montreal and make batteries there. Uh, the focus for us is to, is to uh, complete our product for transportation market. And, uh, and, and we do cylindrical 
um, batteries now, 18650, and hopefully soon 21700, which can be utilized in different transportation applications from sports cars all the way to, to trucks and buses. Thank you. Hello? Oh, sorry. It's like being back on Zoom and on mute. Um, so uh, now that I've rudely interrupted myself and you guys have had a chance to uh, do your intros, I will loop back to you, Mark. Um, you know, the technologies that come through Nova Nix's door, based on what you're seeing in terms of uh, viability through testing, but also knowing what the end users want, if you were going to hedge bets, what do you think the, uh, the battery technology of tomorrow is? That's a really interesting question, and it took a while for me to kind of put my thoughts in order. Um, you're right. At Novonix, we work with a whole spectrum of, of customers, all the way from household name OEMs, cell manufacturers, and startups along the whole skew of, of technology readiness levels. And what really sticks out in my mind is... First of all, lithium-ion batteries, at least today as we know them, aren't going anywhere. Um, there's a lot of incremental step changes that are happening, that are occurring in the space, in the industry, reducing costs and uh, improving environmental footprint. But really, the base materials, they're, 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 they're pretty sticky, using Dan's terminology. Uh, look at the cathode space. So I, I can envision a future enabled by all of the above, LFP, NMC, even LMO. It really all comes down to the appetite for the end user um, towards reduction in cost um, and uh, reduction in environmental footprint. So the answer to the question is, is pretty unsatisfactory. It's, it depends. It entirely depends. Um, it's, it's, it's actually an incredible space to work in because there's developments happening all the time that are reducing these the, the, the barrier cost to entry. But anyway, that's, that's my, my story on, on, on lithium ion. And really, we, it's, it's amazing. Um, going beyond lithium ion now, there's a whole other class of chemistries and technologies, including uh, solid state, lithium sulfur, lithium air, anode free. These things have merit. They're, at some point, there's, there's going to be a pivotal shift when, when lithium ion just can't cut it anymore, right? So. It's important to consider, again, it depends. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, there's, there's another class of materials like we have to think about, which is the elephant in the room, is what happens when we, we deplete all of this lithium and when we deplete all of these nickel deposits and whatever other deposits that go into a battery. You need to have to think about recycling. Recycling is an important aspect to all of this, but then you have to balance the economics of recycling versus other technology streams like sodium ion that's gaining traction, right? So, so what we're really focused on at Novonics, aside from all the customer work and the trends and being ingrained in the market, we're working on really focusing in on making sustainable, uh, scalable methods of producing battery materials primary, primarily for the lithium ion sector. Because that's, for us right now, the, the easiest and the stickiest place to be for these incremental step changes in processing tech. So we're doing that with our anode business in Tennessee, and as well as our new all-dry, zero-waste cathode synthesis work that's going on in Halifax today, where we're undergoing testing of this material. So at the end of the day, it really depends on what technology is going to be there, just around the corner. Um, but let me make it very abundantly clear is we need to be working on these other types of technologies and materials today such that when we need them, we're, they're ready for commercialization. Raphael, do you have anything to add to that on the quantum computing side and what you think the, the battery technology of tomorrow will be based on what you know, your work can bring to the, the space? Yeah, I mean, quantum computing is, is a little bit bizarre and uh, I appreciate being here, uh, but, but I don't necessarily fit in. Um, uh, what I would say is the, the real impact of quantum is going to be massively transformational. It's like sitting in 1940 and thinking about digital computing and what can it do. And similarly, a lot of the things we think about today are science-based, material-based, simulation-based uh, types of problems. A year ago, we launched the world's most powerful quantum computer, demonstrated something called quantum computational advantage which was able to run a specific task in about 
200 milliseconds that would take the world's most powerful quant or supercomputer millions of years to actually run. And that type of speed up is what we're looking to do now on the material simulation side. So the work that we're doing with Volkswagen, uh, the work that we're going to be kicking off with some other uh, OEMs, the work that we've done previously with BMW, is really focused on developing the algorithms that are going to run on these quantum computers, which are drastically different than what you would do classically, that can provide that same speed up for the material simulation side. This means that to examine all the battery chemistries that were just mentioned, you now don't have to do the wet lab work, you don't have to generate the materials, but you could actually do it all in silico. The other big thing is one of precision. Um, you know, we often work with quantum chemists uh, at, at the OEMs. Um, they're relying on methods today like DFT, uh, which have been really the workhorse of developing the fundamental uh, chemistry that power our batteries today. But they're all based on approximations. Uh, we don't have the computational power to simulate these systems at the fundamental quantum level. Um, the battery space is one that we kind of chose to uh, engage on uh, for two main reasons. One, as seen by everybody here today, from an economics point of view, it's a very big and well-funded area today, uh, meaning that we can do some substantial work. But more importantly, it's not a single computational challenge that we're trying to solve. Whether looking at material oxidation, whether looking at novel electrolytes, whether looking at the thermal properties of a whole battery, these are wildly different computational problems. And trying to figure out how to run those on a quantum computer is actually a pretty massive uh, problem. Finally, just to reiterate maybe what I said earlier, this isn't something that's going to start generating candidate chemistries in the next year or two. These algorithms are still going to have to wait for the hardware to catch up. Us, IBM, Google, uh, Amazon, everybody is working uh, on this mammoth mission to build a quantum computer that can tackle these problems. Uh, but that's still at least five to 10 years away. One caveat is we've been saying that for the last 25 years. So whether you choose to believe that or not, uh, I'll leave it up to you. But, but the time is coming when we'll be able to leverage these to, to simulate uh, much more than we can do today. Thanks. I feel like there's a, a collaboration potentially here between. <laughs> I, I mean, we, we already talked to, to some of the academic groups uh, uh, that I'm sure you're working with as well. Uh, but like I said, we're a little earlier stage, so uh, we would love to collaborate. I'm not sure whether they have the resources right now to dedicate to our collaboration. Um, so Adrian, um, you know, we've heard a couple different battery chemistries mentioned, but um, nothing very, very specific on solid state. So could you, um, you know, give us your perspective on how solid state fits into this from, you know, the work that Blue Solutions has done and, um, you know, what's going to happen there in terms of innovation in all the other landscape moving parts. So uh, let's talk about solid state. Um, the way that uh, we understand the industry is uh, lithium ion, the prevailing technology, uh, batteries, um, will plateau in terms of uh, the performance that they'll be able to deliver. When it's going to happen, we don't know. I mean, there are companies, particularly in Asia, the largest battery manufacturers that are doing a really good job in trying to increase the capacity, the safety, and those kind of uh, aspects of the battery technology. Nevertheless, there are some issues related to safety uh, that uh, solid state provides in addition to the expected uh, significant increase in uh, energy storage capacity. So, uh, and that's where we're going and that's uh, the fundamental basis of our technology. We've been, uh, our, our uh, batteries are not cylindrical, our batteries are about this size and uh, 100 layers. Um, it's based on manufacturing techniques that uh, uh, the group that owns uh, Blue Solutions has developed uh, literally over 200 years, starting with ultra-thin papers and then ultra-thin films. And then uh, we have a chemistry that is uh, unique. Uh, it's based on a lithium metal anode, a solid electrolyte, and a cathode material that is LFP. And um, just to give you an idea in terms of the safety aspects, uh, the comparison, 
uh, the gel uh, or liquid on a lithium ion battery typically catches fire at 80 degrees, 80. Our electrolyte, and that's due to the electrolyte, uh, the electrolyte, the solid electrolyte, catches fire at around 270, lithium metal about 180. So there is a significant safety aspect to the potential of what is called a thermal runaway event when a battery heats up and, and propagates uh, and potentially may, may create a lot of risk and, and even fires. Uh, so we're looking at what's going on. We have developed a product, and the product that we have, the chemistry, uh, is a little bit uh, old now by, uh, by today's standards, particularly when we started putting them in cars and in, in buses, in electric buses, for example, Daimler and the city of Paris has uh, several hundred of uh, our batteries in buses. Uh, you know, I, I keep telling that around 2011 or so, a guy with the first name of Elon appeared and said, uh, we need fast charge, fast charge, fast charge. And uh, even though when the car is uh, parked for most of, you know, most of the time. So um, that has pushed us basically to continue to innovate. And now we're working on our fourth generation battery technology. And even though not a lot of people know about solid state, they come to us. We're not, we're not a startup. Uh, we're still like part of an industrial group. Um, we fly low, if you will, and, but they come and they look at our technology, the OEMs, and, and they're blown away, literally, and, uh, and they want to engage. So we're working now on trying to develop, if you will, the solid state battery. Uh, I, I call them in, uh, like uh, ice cream, in uh, ice cream flavors, vanilla, chocolate, or, uh, or uh, strawberry, you know, each for indicating a different uh, OEM, if you will, so that they can incorporate it into their final product. We are looking first at the customer the user, the buyer of the vehicle, as the ultimate goal. So safety first, then the necessary um, innovation to go along with the requirements of each individual customer segment, whether one needs energy or power, etc. And that's what we're trying to do. So we're working on the lithium metal anode to try to reduce the thickness of the anode. We specialize in extrusion techniques and ultra thin films, as I mentioned. So. Uh, battery makers, knowing that lithium metal anode is going to be one of the prevailing battery um, anodes of the future, uh, the, you know, the largest battery makers, they want to come to us, and obviously it's, it's something that we don't want to share at this time, because it gives us a competitive advantage. We do it in a very large role, very, very thin uh, uh, format. So uh, we're trying to innovate, and then uh, given that the, the cost of the battery, a lithium metal battery, um, is driven by the cost of lithium metal as a product, as a material, and it's extremely high, um, particularly since the last uh, 10 months or so, we're trying to reduce that and trying to be ahead of the competition. So in terms of innovation, we're doing all these applications. We're trying to be uh, nimble and at the same time uh, be able to fit uh, in the market requirements, and, uh, and it's looking really good. So Dan, stepping back from the specific battery types and chemistries, which, you know, there's no doubt innovation is happening here. Um, we have a lot of different options on the table. Um, you know, you, you were talking about how, um, you know, Nano One has looked at what's happened around the world in terms of how batteries are made and, and the environmental impact of that. Obviously, that's not a great side of our industry. Could <laughs> use some work. Um, but on the other side is, you know, there are some incredible supply chains and ecosystems that have built up around the world. Should Canada be trying to copy those and you know make them work here, or should we be? Do we require a unique supply chain with with you know characteristics specific to our country? Um, yeah, so that's a that's a great um, question, um, and and uh, I, I think what we. We definitely don't want to copy how it's done um, in China or Korea or Japan, where the, the, the majority of cathode materials are made. Um, um, and um, for competitive reasons, I think we need to we need to find a way to differentiate our supply chains. Um, but what we we can take from these very successful supply chains that are out there is that they uniquely innovated their supply chains for their countries and their jurisdictions. And that's what we have to do in Canada and North America. We have to um, innovate our supply chains so um, that we capture the most out of them. So that we are, you know, we, the energy intensity is low, the, the, the waste streams are low. I think we need to take advantage 
of our of our um, uh, of our high environmental standards, our permitting. Uh, certainly, we have to um, we have to uh, um, improve the speed of permitting. But I think our permitting regime is uh, it should be held up high as a uh, as as really a, as a global um, uh, stewardship in in the space. So I think we can take advantage of those, and that's those, these are unique to North America. And uh, certainly, we have uh, we know we have lithium and we have nickel, um, and we you know we have a bunch of the uh, the critical minerals in place. But to get them from those critical minerals into intermediate chemicals and into uh, battery grade metals and into cathode materials, um, those steps have to be uh, really unique to uh, to uh, what we are doing in Canada. So the thing to really take from these these uh, supply chains, the reason China is successful is because you know, I'll take lithium iron phosphate as an example. Um, uh, the iron that comes uh, from uh, that, that's used in China in lithium iron phosphate comes out of the, the titanium mining space. So uh, when you uh, process titanium into pigments, uh, white pigments like titanium oxide, um, China has a very unique process. It's actually a much older process. Um, the rest of the world uses a much more innovative process to to, uh, um, to manufacture titanium oxide. China results in having a big iron sulfate waste stream. So they have piles and piles of iron sulfate lying around. The rest of the world doesn't have that. So we can't copy their supply chain because we don't have it. Um, uh, we've got iron, um, but we don't have iron in that form. And so we have to uh, we have to think very carefully about that and how we use that. Now, uh, one of the things that we have discovered in Nano One, um, we can go directly from iron metal powders, which is why we're uh, partnered with Rio Tinto, who have the largest iron powder manufacturing facility just north of Montreal in, in, in Sahel Tracy. And that is a, uh, um, uh, you know, that's a real advantage because we can go uh, from iron that is smelted in electric arc furnaces that are powered by, um, this is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good example of how we can differentiate. Uh, their, their iron is smelted um, into titanium and iron in, a, uh, in their facilities uh, in Sorel. Uh, under uh, in, in electric arc furnaces that are powered by hydroelectric power, and there is no waste stream. There is no chemical waste stream because it's a metallurgical process. They go direct to iron metal powder. That powder is uh, produced in a form uh, that is already used by the automotive industry. It's class one iron metal powder that is uh, approved by the auto industry, and it's it's made in in very significant volumes. Uh, in fact, we've developed a way to take that directly into lithium iron phosphate. So there is zero waste stream, and it's all done under the umbrella of a uh, uh, of of hydroelectric power, and that will be the cleanest, the cleanest, greenest, and shortest uh, supply chain uh, on the earth, on the planet today. So uh, can we, uh, we, this is where we need to innovate. This is how we need to create um, uh, supply chains that are uniquely differentiated. They'll be lower cost, they'll be you know, cleaner, and of course, uh, use less energy. And that will make us stand out from the incumbent supply chains that have been developing over the last 20, 30 years in, in Asia. We have the advantage of coming to it late, so we can see what's wrong with the existing supply chain. Uh, you can't take those waste streams they have th that are in China and actually in other jurisdictions and scale them to tens of millions of tons. Uh, um, they work fine at 100,000 tons. You can kind of deal with it. But if we're going to make terawatt hours of batteries, uh, we're going to make 300 terawatt hours of batteries by 2050. We will be generating um, over a billion tons of sodium sulfate waste if we don't address this problem and, uh, and the opportunities in front of us to, uh, to deal with that. So I think Kunar brought it up from um, um, uh, LI Metal earlier in an earlier panel. Uh, it is a, a significant challenge, but it's, an op it's, it's a generational opportunity, I think, for the ecosystem, um, uh, certainly in Canada and North America, um, to, to do it differently and, uh, and make something that's going to be long and sticky and, and, uh, uh, and, and resilient uh, and that will last us um, into in many generations. So. So Asma, I really want to get your thoughts on everything you've heard just from, um, you know, your position with the National Research Council, but Sarush, you were nodding along enthusiastically. Did you want to add anything there? Well, it's for me, the question. Do you have anything to add before we, we move on? I, I can add something, sure. actually. Uh, so <laughs> just to, <laughs> to jump on what, what he said, uh, for sure we need innovation uh, specific to our supply chain, greener, um, more efficient processes, but we also we have a specific weather in Canada, so technologies that are specific to our climate are, are very relevant. 
And just to jump to where Mark said, because I'm, you know, on the on the material testing manufacturing side of the batteries, uh, I won't say it depends. That was his answer. I, I will say we need all of them actually. Next generation, we need everything, new technologies, the current one, the next generation of recycled batteries. So we have 33 million vehicles in Canada. So I don't think in 20. 20, uh, 2023, I think, 2025 or 30, uh, so there won't be any more sales of, of uh, ICE vehicles. So the demand will be huge, and we need really everything possible, you know, to make those next technologies happen. So I won't repeat, but I, I agree with everything that has been said. So I'm going to push back for one second on that. Do you think we run the risk if we have all of the technologies and, you know, we're kind of not pointing in different directions, but we have different um, research teams following up on different threads of not moving the ship in the same direction. Like, should we be concentrating on, on a couple at least? Or do you think as wide a playing field as possible is best? But I think we, we, we don't have the choice to be part of what's going on because, you know, there are Giga factories in North America. They need minerals, they need, so we, we have to be there because it's an opportunity for, for Canada, but we don't have to put all our, you know, <laughs> all our cards there and, and, and be smart and, and maybe develop things that are specific for our, our reality. But for sure, it's, it's a huge opportunity for Canada to, uh, to be part of the supply chain. Uh, and, and I think the whole morning we heard about this, so I, I won't repeat what, what has been said, but, you know, there is a huge opportunity, of course. So, so listen, there's a lot of innovation happening now, right? Um, I mean, not necessarily all of them get to the finish line, but innovations that, that we, we hear every day in the media of a new technology, a new material, a new way of doing things. I guess um, we can see a bunch of those innovations as incremental, just they're improving the existing uh, liquid electrolyte lithium ion batteries, and some are disruptive, like uh, solid state lithium metal, lithium air, and, and, and you name it. There's a lot of different uh, or lithium sulfur type, uh, the batteries out there. But if we focus just on the on the cell side, uh, not the module and pack, on the cell, <clears throat> there's a bunch of uh, new materials coming. Like we introduce graphene and graphene enhanced additive for the for the batteries. So um, silicon is one of those type of material that everyone wants to use for the battery. But the problem is the moment you add it, it goes through a lot of expansion and contraction, so the lifetime of your battery drops. So you can't use it really for for transportation, and, and we are trying to, for instance, address that using our graphene and graphene technology, and we proved that within, within Volta Explore that by adding that additive to the, to the battery, we can actually extend uh, the capacity by up to 20%, about 15 to 20%, which represents about 8 to 10% of range extension for the vehicle, but this is without sacrificing um, the lifetime of the battery. You can actually put more and get more capacity, but your car is not going to drive eight years that they were talking about, right? So, so the, the key is to get the innovation um, to address a problem, but also uh, get it to the finish line and get it to the market and make sure that it's cost effective and people actually can use it, right? This is the part that is very challenging because a lot of cool things happens out there. Like I'm a PhD. I love doing all sorts of new things, but not necessarily people pay for it. <clears throat> and you, you got to make sure that that it addresses a real problem and is also uh, bring profitability for the stakeholder involved in it. There's other innovation that, that, that we see in the dimension of the batteries. Like uh, uh, there's uh, the same uh, Elon guy that you mentioned went to the 4680, right? And, and we see that as much you go with the larger size of the battery, you have a better energy density in your pack level. So it, it helps. So these innovations are incremental. Uh, dry manufacturing uh, that, that Tesla is putting in place after Maxwell acquisition. These are all innovations that, that makes it more profitable but also usable for people. So the key is to use these technologies and, and, and in the right place. <clears throat> now if we go to the, um, we talk about LFPs and NMCs and, and, and I think nobody talk about NCAs because there's too much cobalt in there. Uh, but, but the key is to find the right application. Uh, not everyone wants the same type of batteries. There is, uh, there you have power batteries, you have, uh, you have batteries for transportation, power tools, and, and so on. So again, matching the properties of, of, of the battery with the requirement of the customer is the key. 
and innovation should enable this path and close that. So I think there's a lot of innovation happening, um, but we're not cognizant of, of the timing of applying those technologies. A lot of gigafactories are coming in 2025. So these, these uh, gigafactories are not just gonna go and retool again before starting to have different type of technologies in them. So the timing of the innovation and where the market is today, which is, I think everybody in the OEM side, they all want batteries now. They're all looking for 21700 to 4680. So at this time, um, the demand is very strong and supply is limited. And in this, this ecosystem, um, you don't necessarily need a lot of innovation, but to sustain that in the long term and to make sure we don't, we run, we don't run out of the material, innovation is very important. So the theme of the morning, for me at least, feel free to disagree, um, was uh, that a skilled workforce is absolutely like the make or break moment on um, you know, Canada being able to get to that next generation battery and ideally um, produce it here. Um, as well as, I believe the phrase was excruciatingly slow uh, in terms of you know, us having uh, progress on, on um, you know, manufacturing and, and um, the ability to, to be nimble. So I'd like to put those two themes to the group um, to discuss how that applies to battery technology and the work that not only you're all doing um, individually, but you know, collectively as well. Like what is, what is the industry's feeling on the skills and the, the timing of everything that's happening now? Feel free to jump in. So I uh, represent Blue Solutions um, at the Canadian Battery Task Force. It's something we, we talk about uh, quite often. Hello to some of my colleagues here. Um, and it's something that I can see, um, I'm on in business development, but I can see that we need more and more technical people. It's difficult to hire um, skilled uh, professionals. And uh, we're gearing towards building gigafactories. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm not even talking about our competitors that are already building them. Uh, so it seems to me that that, that ecosystem of uh, educational ecosystem training, uh, whether you know, training at the companies, providing a path from uh, school to work uh, is extremely, extremely important perhaps the government could formulate some kind of incentives to provide that both for the people that are gonna be looking into those opportunities to find them more compelling, and then for the companies to, be to try to satisfy their needs. Maybe just to add a little bit to that, uh, we, we face a similar problem and definitely our partners that are in the battery space are, are the same. Uh, academic institutions are really slow in moving and updating curriculum. Uh, especially in something as fast moving as the battery space. Um, so often the time that you know courses come in uh, that are dedicated for training people up, it's far too late. Um, it's really expensive to do this from a small medium enterprise side, especially a lot of the companies here doing kind of the cutting edge development are not massive companies that have the resources to dedicate um, to training people internally. You of course have to do some of it but it is a very expensive proposition. There's a lot of great government programs. Uh, we leverage many of them in order to do this, but the burden uh, that comes with those programs just from a sheer administrative point of view is also really, really large. Uh, what for us has been the biggest success, and I'd be interested to know if, if it holds true for, for the other companies, has been uh, Canada's ability to import top talent from around the world. Uh, there's great programs, Global Talent Stream is one, um, that we leverage pretty extensively. Um, the, I would say, quality of life in Canada has also been a really great draw for bringing people in. Uh, without that, definitely a company like Xanadu couldn't exist. Um, and just to kind of put a number on it, 60% of our employees, we've actually brought in on specific visas and they've become either permanent residents um, or citizens of Canada uh, at this point. From a, an innovation perspective, I will say science is excruciating long. <laughs> Every single innovation actually you bring in terms of materials or manufacturing processes or you know, the time you mature, you understand the technology and you transfer it to industry and you implement it, it take 10 years or more. Uh, you know, I think there, there, there is this double, um, not dialogue, but two 
you know, two per perspectives to, to what's happening in the battery industry. For sure, mature technologies, uh, like in terms of mining or, you know, companies that want th those initiatives has to be, you know, they, they should be speed up and, the, the, you know, the, the funding from governments and so on has to be, like, quick. Uh, but in terms of science, it's the science that dictates, you know, even like he mentioned quantum and AI and even developing those tools, you know, to speed up the research are time consuming. So, so there is a, like an inherent limitation to science and innovation to be able to take all those innovations to the, you know, to the market. So it's my point of view. <laughs> all right. So labor is always a problem, not just in the battery space. Everywhere in North America you go, that's a problem. So in, in Nano, we have 11 plants in, in North America and Europe, and the, the common team always is to finding the correct and right labor. So there are labor out there, but you just don't want to keep them after a few months, right? So, so on the battery space, I think the biggest challenge now, even on, on, the, on the talent pool, is the IRA. IRA is going to absorb a lot of investment in US. And if the plants are in US, uh, people are going to be in the U.S., and they're going to gonna bring a lot of people from Canada to U.S., makes it even harder for us in Canada to, to hire. So I think um, uh, feds, they have to address IRA. We're, we're desperately waiting for the budget to come out to see what's the measures against IRA. But if it's not addressed, it's going to get even worse as the time passes, and, and at some point it forces even the companies in this panel to think about moving down south. So, uh, so I, I, think, I think the biggest problem is, is the IRA and how we can address that. I'm, I'm not going to um, repeat all this stuff because I completely agree. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a competitive problem in, uh, uh, to compete, certainly with some of the, uh, especially with like salaries and some of the things that, are, that exist outside of Canada. I think Canada doesn't keep, compete as well on a salary to uh, cost of living uh, point of view. Um, that's a systematic problem. and. Um, uh, and I think everyone on the panel here totally recognizes that. Um, unique to the battery space, of course, it's growing so fast um, that th what there is is there's very little experience in the world. Um, and that, uh, that's a challenge. Um, it's very hard to bring in experienced people, whether that's in Canada or outside of Canada. Uh, attracting them to Canada, as we've just discussed, is difficult. Um, uh, um, perhaps uh, it's, it'll be, it's easier to bring in younger people, but certainly uh, experienced people outside of Canada, it's very hard to bring them in. Um, what we've done, and I wanna, maybe this is what I really want to talk about, is how, how did we deal with this? Um, we grew most of our talent uh, organically. So we identified people that weren't even necessarily in the battery material space, but let's say had the, uh, had the transition metal chemistry experience and the aptitude, so we brought them in and trained them or brought them up. You can't, you can't do that continuously. Um, and so when we saw the opportunity to, uh, uh, we, last year, um, uh, on November 1st, we completed the acquisition of Johnson Matthew Battery Materials Canada, which is a, uh, when they were selling off their cathode materials space uh, business, we, uh, we made a bid on their Canadian division. And what that came with, not only a plant uh, um, I, that is, uh, that's permitted with land to expand and all of that, um, but, it, but the primary thing is it came with people came with people and talent. These are people that have been working in the space in Quebec uh, for between 10 and 20 years. Uh, 50 people, uh, it's a tremendous amount of experience. Um, it's a drop in the bucket in terms of what you need, but what we see that is, is not only as a tool really to, 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 to drive um, knowledge into Nano One about manufacturing, we're, we're very good on the innovation side, but we don't, we don't have the scale-up knowledge and, and these, uh, this team brings it. But they, uh, what we're seeing now is, is they become a vehicle um, to grow organically um, uh, and, and to funnel our people through and actually start um, uh, nurturing uh, knowledge and know-how, using the talent we do have in place to nurture and grow, uh, you know, real, live, experienced talent within the uh, Canadian ecosystem. Uh, you know, obviously, we'd like to keep them within our own organization, but we recognize too that, that that'll be part of the sprinkling out and, and spreading that knowledge um, into the uh, into the greater ecosystem. So, uh, that's just uh, that's kind of our approach right now. Uh, ask me in two years; I'm sure it'll be a bit different, but that's where we stand right now. Yeah, I agree with what everybody said. Um, the the thing that it always comes back to to me, uh, and I and and it is, I, we take the same approach as Dan takes. We we take the the organic growth and training um, young and up and coming battery science or scientists to become battery scientists. Right? It's it's the name of the game. Um, but you could do a lot with a lot of money, 
Um, and you can do a lot with money in terms of um, doing things faster, getting more people here, and actually training, right? So, so uh, the takeaway for me, I guess, is uh, in terms of what the government could be doing is more so investing in people, investing in people and um, pushing through these new energy storage programs at local universities, all of this fun stuff. So yeah, I, I don't need to belabor the point. I think everything else was said already. If I could just kind of add to what Mark's saying there, um, the, um, the challenge is really to get that really experienced talent. How do you get someone in, into Canada with, uh, or, or how do you, you know, where do you find that person with 20, 30 years of, let's say, manufacturing or scale up uh, experience, uh, the, 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 the chemical engineer? There aren't many around the world. Obviously, most of them are, are uh, in Asia. And, uh, and I know a ton of them have been sucked over to, uh, to Norway and Sweden with Northvolt and, and various other um, uh, operations that are going on over there. But we, you know, we haven't been very uh, successful in, in bringing them in. But that is the challenge. I think we need to bring that talent in because um, you can't really address, you can address that problem with money by hiring them in, but you can't, you, like the experience is experience. But 20, 20 years of experience takes 20 years to build. Um, you can't fast track that. <laughs> Um, but what you can do is, uh, you know, we, we think we have to have a very, I think we have to activate a program that allows us to bring at least a modicum of that talent to, to uh, Canada to be, uh, to be the educators of, uh, of our up and growing workforce. So, you know, we're up against excruciatingly slow, excruciatingly long, and you can't replace 20 years experience without putting in 20 years experience. So. What do we need to do though right now, like today, in a sentence or less from each of you, in order to um, make sure that Canada not only has, you know, is producing the IP for the next generation batteries, but you know, is is producing the value added materials along the way, if not actually making them here. And Asme, we'll start with you. Well, I'm <clears throat> sorry. I, I think what we need to do right now, you know, to catch this train, which is going fast. Uh, definitely we need more mines to have more minerals, um, responsible mining processes, of course, uh, have all the, the, the processes actually that make, you know, from the minerals to the battery grade materials have that, that expertise in-house and innovate in that space as well. Um, Innovate, collaborate. I think these these are the things that we really need to do fast. So I will speak up a little bit of you know the National Research Council. So this is exactly what we are trying to do. So we are aligned with other government labs. Uh, so there is a, the Canadian Battery Initiative. There is the Critical Mineral, where we try actually to launch like five years projects. We involve industry so they can tell us exactly what they need so we can develop. So for example, I, I will mention one of the, the, the projects on, on graphite processing. So we developed actually the know-how, how to transform uh, graphite you know, flakes from the mineral to the battery grade, how to characterize it, how to demonstrate it in a, in, a, in a real, you know, cell, up to the EV size cell. And now we are working actually with the, with the a lab from NRCAN actually to scale up that process uh, in terms of purification. So we are actually trying to put in place all the support actually that the Canadian ecosystem needs. And there are a lot of opportunities, you know, through those programs, through IRAP, uh, and yeah, so I think these are the things. So innovate, collaborate, and uh, this is the key. <laughs> Thank you. Rafael? Uh, I, I think do the not Canadian thing and bet big on, on a direction. Like one of the things that I find in, in our industry and, and definitely working with battery scientists, we see the same thing is uh, any funding that we do get from federal programs tends to be evenly distributed across everything. Um, we just don't have enough funding to be able to do that effectively, and we have to pick some winners. It doesn't have to be necessarily companies, but it should be approaches that we won't know whether they'll succeed or not, but at least we'll be able to fund them to give them a, a fighting chance. And then the other one, because I face it every day, when we do put these programs forward, and especially on the talent side, the administrative cost of engaging in them can't be higher than the monetary value that you get back. We need to figure out how to streamline these things so there's actually an economic incentive for engaging with the programs to train the people internally, locally, for uh, companies. Mark? Invest. That's, that's pretty much it. Invest in the space. 
Uh, look, look at what's going on south of the border. Look at the IRA. Look at the BIL. Like these things are effective. It's it's producing innovation in uh, battery technology. Uh, look at all the winners of all of these awards that are going out. So if Canada wants to fast track, if Canada wants to remain relevant, we essentially need to invest, and that'll. I don't want to say set us free, but uh, it, it'll help a whole heck of a lot. Um, we have so many resources, so many critical minerals that can go into uh, effectively a, a proper lithium ion battery plant or, or building the cells, right? We have lithium, we have nickel, manganese, iron, graphite, everything that you want. And we just need to develop these, these mines, these materials, um, both from the mineral point of view all the way to the material point of view and producing the finished product. It's invest. That's my takeaway. Adrian? Yeah, so um, I agree with that. And um, representing a company from Quebec, I'm a little bit biased. Uh, and, and I really like uh, what I see in the province. I'm not going to belabor what Simone and Investissement in Quebec uh, has spoken about. But I, I like the model, and I think that uh, it's a successful approach. I know in other areas of Canada, other provinces, there are similar uh, type of uh, endeavors. And, and I think that that's what needs to be done. But the incentives that I've seen apply a lot of times are misapplied. So there are incentives that are given to companies that are perhaps using it to create a product with components coming from another country. I won't say where. Uh, so I think that the formulation of the incentives have to be more aligned with the interests of the Canadians. So the more value, Canadian value, is added to the solution, you can call it a quantum computer, you can call it a battery, whatever that may be, the higher the incentive level. And I think that that will accelerate this uh, process of uh, innovation and, and, and growth in the industry. Uh, Dan. Um, so Canada obviously has the critical minerals, um, uh, I, and I, I firmly believe we have the talent. Um, uh, ultimately, uh, Canada has the, uh, has the clean energy, uh, the renewable energy, um, the ecosystems, and ultimately, Canada also has uh, has free trade access to the whole G7. Um, so we have a very uh, we have a very incredible sort of basket here of things to uh, to work with, and um, you know I I believe, and I said I said it earlier, this is a generational opportunity to bring it all together. We have to do it together. We have to do it collectively as an ecosystem. Uh, we have to we have to work with our competitors and work with our partners um, to build this uh, to build this ecosystem. We can't change the supply chain one company at a time. It doesn't work that way. Everyone's got to want the change for the supply chain to come and play. So uh, it's it's really super critical. But we, but we and it's a it's a phenomenal undertaking. But we have to do it. Uh, we have to do it with less energy and less waste and less water. Um, uh, all of these things are are super critical to making this a uh, a, a long-term uh, resilient solution uh, that will put Canada on the on the sort of global competitive scale. And that's I'll leave it there. And last word to you, Sarish. So I agree with pretty much all the points. Investment, immigration, they're all going to help. Um, I, I really like the, the the comment about the ecosystem. It's it's very important to to to. Uh, um, to help this ecosystem to grow by itself, but also enable it. Uh, I, I can say from, from my experience, um, uh, five or six years ago, um, we, uh, in Nano, we reached out to, to Martin Ria to, to actually invest in the company. And, and throughout this time, I can say having a strategic investor and partner can actually help very a lot the growth of the company. I mean, where Nano was at the time that Martin Ray came on board, and, and after six years, it, it's just a total different company. So uh, tapping into existing uh, tier ones, uh, large companies there, and, and they, they, they have the resources to support you to grow. And if you grow fast enough, you can pay the big bucks for the, for the top employees as well. Sounds good. All right, well, thank you, everybody. And we have a couple minutes for audience questions. So um, I think I see a couple over there to start. Um, if we could run mics, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your insightful thoughts. Um, one thing we heard earlier today from uh, Linda was that 
the production of lithium batteries on average, uh, um, they produce about 17 tons of, of carbon emissions equivalent to three years of driving a traditional vehicle. From the perspective of battery manufacturers, um, what can we do to further incentivize innovation in, this, in that space in terms of reducing the carbon footprint in the production process? Maybe I can take that. Um, I think that the basis of that number is uh, perhaps that a lot of the supply chain is originating overseas, uh, particularly in China. And uh, that's where most of the emissions attributed to that would come. Uh, in our case, for example, so we, we have the, the factory in Quebec, and initially, the LFP for our cathode, we used to uh, buy it in Quebec. And then as uh, Quebec, uh, Quebec uh, became less competitive, we had to bring it from China. Uh, now with the ecosystem being developed and all that, we're getting to a point where we have hydroelectricity, we have the mines there, the whole ecosystem, like Sarush was talking about, is over there. So that would be, that's a drastic way to do it, in spite even of innovations that we may, doing with, uh, we may be doing with new chemistries and so forth. So the, the, there's already, uh, you know, if, if you are in the right place at the right time, call it Quebec or call it another place uh, where you have a, a short uh, distance to the supply chain, as uh, uh, Dan uh, was implying, then I think that uh, uh, most of the problem is, is addressed. Uh, I can add, uh, actually, from more from an R&D perspective, because uh, we're not an industry, we're not producing, but uh, in terms of battery manufacturing, there are a lot of things, actually, that could be done to, you know, to uh, achieve greener processes, for example. Uh, I know a lot of, you know, water-based uh, coating of active materials instead of using, for example, NMP is something that has been developed mainly for anode materials. So we need to do it as well for a cathode. So this is one point. Uh, so we, we, we are actually also working on uh, other green solvents. Um, so to be able to manufacture in a greener way, uh, think about design for recycling, you know. Uh, can we design the batteries in a way that we can easily maybe reuse some of the components instead of crushing the whole battery and ending up, you know, with like the black mass? So all these are things, um, for example, large, large format cells, they have a lot of challenges. So what can we do to, uh, in terms of quality control, in terms of you know, um, optimizing those processes to have like less scrap? So the list is huge in terms of, of innovation. So there are a lot of, lot of space for that as well. So. All right, I think we have time for another two minute question, if anyone has one. Great, one here. The <laughs> Kevin Heal with Bank of Montreal Radical. Um, Dan, I wanted to pick up on a comment you made about uh, uh, you know, uh, embracing Canada's high environmental standards as a way of differentiating it ourselves. And I thought that was kind of a refreshing comment because I'm coming from Alberta and Western Canada, I'm, I'm used to hearing business people complain about our, uh, our uh, environmental standards and so anyways, I thought that was something that really should be picked up on. Notwithstanding that, we still need to be able to bring resource extension projects to fruition a lot quicker than we do. So, so anyways, I want to acknowledge that. Thanks, Kevin. I'll just maybe add to that one thing. I totally agree. Um, we, need to, we need to streamline our permitting process. We need to get... We need to get to those environment, those environmentally approved projects faster. But really, it's that it's that standard that can really set us apart. So um, uh, thank you for uh, for raising that back. But uh, but yeah, streamlining is going to be really key. I've heard it from Minister Wilkinson at, at Enercan that that is one of their objectives. They're trying to find ways to to streamline these projects, get them online faster, uh, without um, uh, making sacrifices to the environmental standards. I lied. We have a minute 30 seconds okay. before we're played off the oh, stage. Just uh, <laughs> one last question. So, um, we're, uh, pretty, I'm very interested more to see your opinion on like uh, the energy density side, right? So, uh, whenever we're talking about long haul trucking, it's uh, the uh, it's very important to have like uh, very light, right? Because like even when we have that period, the déjà, I don't know how to say it in English, but uh, like uh, where you have like 4,500 pound. Uh, truck, right, uh, during the winter time, or in the U.S., right, where you're capped out, right? So where would you fit? Do you think that uh, you'll ever be competitive against hydrogen on that sense, or will it be completely segmented? Thank you for the question. Uh, so the idea is solid state will be able to provide all of that higher energy density and, and so forth. Uh, 
where we price point versus uh, hydrogen. I, um, I've been involved with hydrogen in the past. I think that it's uh, very problematic from an infrastructure point of view. Yes, I agree that fuel cells for long term, I mean, long duration tracking is, uh, is a solution, but I'm not sure that is the solution. Uh, so we're looking actually at some other innovative uh, ways uh, to, let's say, uh, recharge the truck so it has uh, less capacity and a longer range, uh, things that I, I, a little bit too early for me to comment, but uh, I would say that in terms of uh, energy capacity, uh, for you know, uh, the bid is on solid state. Any last comments for the final question? Just say I, I think there's there's room for it all. Um, look, we need uh, we need fuel cells. We need the infrastructure to to make them work. They are going to play a very active role in any kind of long range hauling because um, otherwise you're just going to be hauling around a battery, and uh, uh, and it's 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 absolutely essential. Um, you know there are there's going to be unique applications. You know there could be port facilities, A to B applications where where uh, fuel cells are going to uh, play a role. But everyone here is going to be participating in that because uh, you can't really uh, put a fuel cell in a vehicle without a massive battery with it. So batteries are, are play a very functional role with, uh, with fuel cells. And whether that's kind of an 80-20 or a 20-80 mix, um, uh, I think it's, uh, we need it all. Um, uh, and because there is no one application, there is no one driving application. There are many, 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 many different scenarios. And, uh, and uh, hydrogen and fuel cells certainly fill a big part of that. And that's the point. That's why everything depends. It depends on the application. <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> Every, everything all the time or whatever that uh, movie's yes, called. Yes, everything yeah. everywhere all at once, yes. around the clock. That movie was a lot. Um, okay, well, thank you, everybody. Um, on behalf of the room, really appreciate you being here and your wisdom thank and expertise. You.